Join Chris and Suzanne Vester today on Faith Family Fulfillment as they lead discussions on creating a strong bond and having a loving relationship through Christian values. Guests on the show share insightful stories and ideas to enhance a positive family upbringing and create trust in one another, as well as providing encouraging words of wisdom everyone should hear. And now, here are Chris and Suzanne. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Faith Family Fulfillment. I'm your co-host, Chris. And I'm Suzanne. I really want to say, I've read their bio, and I think there's going to be some interesting stories that come out of this conversation. Um, It's James and Shannon, too, correct? Yep. And you guys have been married for 27 years, have three children, um, spaced pretty close. They're not terribly far apart, all of them in their 20s. Um, And it looks like like all of them are serving in a pretty big capacity. So I really want to get into that story as well. But I'm not going to ruin it because I think the story will come out in the conversation. Um, I'll pray us in and we'll just get started. That work for you guys? Thank you so much. Oh, Lord, we come to you today um, knowing that the glory will be yours in all of this story. Um, We will be able to have conversation about how you have shown up in their life. 27 years of marriage is not easy. And um, I can't wait to hear how you lead and guide us through this conversation so that the story that needs to be told is the one that's heard. And we ask that you do lead us and guide us in this conversation. And we ask that you keep us in your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, James and Shannon, how did you come to be James and Shannon too? 27 years married. I'm sure there was some period of time before that, but give us your origin story. How'd that happen? So I'm going to, Shannon tells the initial meeting better. I, um, had finished college in uh, about an hour south of Chicago and had started working and uh, had started attending a church in the area where I was working. It was not an area where I'd lived previously, so everything was kind of new. And then I'm going to hand that part over to Shannon because that's that's where she comes in. So well, I had gotten back from college. I was attending a university in South Carolina and had come home for the summer and was told there was a guy I needed to meet and he would be back from a teen event shortly. So we were just talking and he walked in and I knew instantaneously I had met the man I was going to marry to the point that I called the school the next morning and canceled my reservation and had two and a half months to figure out how to tell my parents I wasn't going back and I hadn't quit college but I had met the man I was going to marry who was dating someone else at the time. Wow. And so over the conver- over the course of the summer, we had some conversations and every time he told me something, you know, I would just say, well, I think I would dump her. I, <laughs> I just would, you know, obviously she's not God's person for you. I would dump her. And that was my response to no matter what he said, you know, so it was just fun. And, you know, finally he came to his senses in October and um, asked me out. We had our first date in November and then we had a nice long time because I had to finish school before we got married on the off chance that God wanted us to have kids early. That was not our plan. And, uh, you know, we wanted to just make sure that we could provide for them. And so we had a great relationship starting and then 27 years. It's been a journey, but it's been fun. So you said you knew immediately that it was he was the guy. What gave you that feeling? Anybody that could walk in the church with an arrow through his head and have a smile on his face after having been with a group of teens for no sleep and week, yeah. everything. I mean, I just knew that was the person. It was just instantaneous. Right. So. Yeah, I had gotten involved in the youth ministry, helping out with the youth ministry at the church. And so there had been a summer retreat and I can't even remember where that arrow came from, but I do remember wearing it. So, so we're going to, um, you guys were married. You did have kids early on. How was that managed? How did you guys survive that, um, that season when you had lots of littles? Well, um, we practiced what I refer to as tag team parenting, um, because the kids came so early in the marriage and I'm, type one diabetic. So I've always had medical expenses that we've had to manage. We, you know, really 
just us both working wasn't really an option. And since they came very early in the marriage, we just did, we didn't have the resources built up. So we worked opposite shifts. Shannon uh, worked the night shift. I worked during the day. And, you know, like I said, tag team, we, one would come in and the other would kind of transition to, to watch the kids so that we didn't have to, to pay or rely on outside child care. And one of us was always there with the boys. So that active parenting, right? You said tag team, like it's super active. Like I hear you. I'm just kind of wondering, like, when did you sleep? Like it was naps, right? Because one's at night, one's during the day. So it was. <laughs> I would, I mean, I would come home and the kids would have to go down for a two hour nap. I didn't care what they did as long as they stayed on their bed. They could nap if they wanted to, they could do whatever. But I had to know I at least had a two hour block of sleep. Right. You know, I mean, it was definitely rough when they were in the two, three, and four year old age, because they were just full on boys, you know, and just kept us busy. But I at least knew that I would get that two hour block of sleep. And then, you know, I could go for the next 12 hours of work. So it was God sustaining. I mean, as we look back, I honestly have no idea how we did, you know, what we did. Cause I would get off shift. James would actually take Josh to work with him and had him in his pack and play next to his desk. And I would leave from Chicago and go and get him to return home for that two hour nap, you know, and then do the normal stuff that you would normally do during the day and then work at night. And, you know, again, looking back, God was the only reason that this was able to work. I mean, I've just recently come to um, the day side, you know, I've been in the night shift for almost 30 years. So trying to transition has taken almost three years to figure out how to sleep during the night and be awake during the day. <laughs> yeah. It's been so long the other way. The non-vampire life, right? Completely. Yeah. Sure. I mean, but overall it worked well because I never had to ask off. I could go to all the field trips. I could, you know, be there for all the kids activities and things because they generally happen before 7 p.m. at night and then during the day. So I was the field trip mom that slept on the way to the place, woke up for it, and then slept on the way back because I was heading into work when we got back. So, but it was still fun. But having their parents in their life 24 hours a day, like, I mean, you, you spoke to not having to rely on outside child care, you know, until I guess when school started, because that probably shifted some things because they were like, you had a period of where they were not, you know, like you said, young kids before mm -hmm school and then after school but having you guys there it's like one of the two of you 24 hours a day had to lead them to like they're all serving now they see you guys serving in the church and every like talk a little bit about how you think that influenced the rest of their life that early period of childhood where they had you present 24 hours a day how do you think that impacted well, I think it definitely uh, just let them know that that we were always there for them. Um, you know, kind of in in terms of serving too. I mean, from a young age, they, we kind of exposed them to that. Um, when I don't know, they were probably, I think maybe our oldest was about six or so. Um, we were at a church in Illinois, and they did a a. Um, served at what was called Hesed House, which was a homeless shelter um, in Aurora, Illinois, and, and our church would serve there. And we'd take the boys along to do that, and they absolutely loved it. Um, they had a, a little store there at the, at the shelter, and the boys would be there, you know, and we'd have, okay, go get this to get it for the resident, go get that. And, you know, they, uh, you know, they would, um, our oldest, uh, was and still is a Chicago Cubs fan and you know there was a resident there with a Chicago Cubs hat he'd sit and talk with them about the Cubs and everything so you know just um, I think exposing them to that early and giving them a chance to be on board with that was very important with the the service uh, that they still uh, continue today even you know despite the um, despite the hecticness I think one other commitment we made was just being a part uh, of the church, even, you know, with a busy schedule and all that, um, 
there was one summer when the boys were little uh, where the church we were attending decided not to do a VBS. And so we sent them to VBSs at other churches. And so like, I think they went to like four or five different ones at a variety of denominations, but it was still, I figured uh, by the end of the summer, they may have known more about the different denominations than we did. I'm not sure, but but again, you know, there were, you know, veggie town values at one church and I can't remember what they were all called. It was just nice because again, not only did it expose them to all different uh, denominations, but groups of people, ages of people, but it brought out some really rich conversations because they had questions, you know, why were there two pulpits? Why was this person in a dress? You know, and so what about, you know, church is important? What does scripture say? And it just brought out a whole bunch of different topics that we probably wouldn't have had if we didn't expose them to different things. And so they've really, I think, had the opportunity to see a lot of things and experience a lot of things, but there was no topic in the house that wasn't able to be talked about. You know, they could come to us with anything at any time. They could bring their friends and ask us any question. There was nothing off limits at any point in time. And I think that's paid off because now in their 20s, they're still coming back and saying, hey, what do you think about this? You know, and so by just fostering the feeling that any question is a good question, you know, there isn't the, the unasked question is the only dumb question you know, just really kind of opened it up for conversations, not only with them, but with their friends. And it's just been fun to kind of see where God has taken that and what opportunities God's opened up just because of that. You know, it's not anything that we did, you know, it's God opening the situations and we happen to be there to give an answer, but, you know, hopefully it was definitely a God-driven answer. You know, but they also knew we were fallible and made mistakes and, you know, forgiveness and repentance are all a part of it. So they saw it full circle within the home, you know, not to say we didn't have our struggles, oh, yeah. but uh, there wasn't anything hid from them. So, you know, they saw full on that we could make mistakes and we could own up to them. And, you know, we were still family, but it's all a part of it. So it's kind of exciting that way. That's good knowledge. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point that you make. Life needs to be reflected first at home so that they don't feel like they don't feel like there's anything wrong with the struggles and the real conversations and the hard things. If if you're handling those at home as a family openly and having those conversations, then when they go out into the world and they find things that are hard and challenging and that need to be discussed and talked about, they're very comfortable with that. They don't shy away from it. I think that's a really good point that you make. It's great. That's a great point. And the other point that I took away from that was the exposure to the different cultures, like expose them to different denominations, expose mm -hmm. them to different situations, which brought up the conversation. You know, without the exposure, there's no there's no conversation, but that curiosity that's created by the exposure. But the key point of that is you guys are prepared to handle the conversations, you know, because of your own walk. Um, so how many times did those conversations come up and you had to go, well, let me get back with you because you had to research and find out like how often did that pop up? I think there were periods of time. I yeah. mean, you know, yes. He always touted daddies know everything, but yeah, I was you know, kidding. But... I know, but I'm just saying <laughs> yeah. it was, you know, it was fun because then the boys were like, oh, so you don't know it, you know, and it's like, yeah, that's right. You know, we're still humans. So, but uh, no, if we didn't know, we would reach out for the resources and the help from other Christians that, you know, were strong in their faith, our pastors, the youth leaders. You know, we would try and just point them back, but more importantly, ask them what they would do. How would they handle it? Because again, if we're telling them, they're never learning. And so helping them understand that they have to kind of figure it out on their own. You know, I think one of the best things we did was their senior year of high school, they had no rules. 
all the rules they had ever known were gone. And they could come and go as they want. They didn't have to tell us. And the only expectation was that on Sunday morning, they were in church, regardless of their decision, because we figured they were going to college. They were going to be leaving the house. We wanted them to know what it was like to choose poorly and still be responsible. And God was always first. And so, you know, they're like, can I go to this party? And I'm like, sure. But remember, church is at nine. We will like you at eight if you're not up, you know, and they tested those waters. But being able to go out and have a little bit of that exposure while they're still in the home, they would come with questions. What do I do with this? How do I handle this? You know, what about, you know, we would get calls. I have a friend that's um, having a problem you know, and we would talk about it and, you know, here are some resources that you can choose. Here are some things you can do. But for the most part, it was helping them learn to problem solve so that when they got out on their own, they had those resources, they had that exposure. And the only way to give that is to literally take those rules away and give them a chance at being the adult that we're telling them they're going to be in that next year. But if they're away at college, then it's like, how do you, how do you help them do that? Or it's easier when they're in the home to say, okay, that was a poor choice. What do you think about that? How are you going to handle it differently next time? You know, was it fun to get up after getting home at 545 in the morning for church at nine? You were a little cranky, you were a little grouchy, (laughs) you know, was that the best option? You know, but again, they learned and they followed through. And again, when they went to college, they were at church even with what they were doing in college, they were still at church on Sunday morning. So, you know, they had learned the different principles and putting God first, you know, was just always it, you know, whether it was travel baseball, whether it was whatever, church still happened. You know, you don't sacrifice anything, nothing else comes in its place. And I think that's one of the biggest things that hopefully they've learned and will carry through as they begin to have families. So, I mean, we see evidence of it with them serving. So hopefully that continues. But again, you know, I think just the advice that we were given to give them a chance to learn before they get out on their own, you know, some of the best advice we could have been given. So, yeah, because again, too, I mean, you know, their senior year, they're still at home. So if they mess up, we're still there to help and support them. And, you know, to a degree, we are at college, we were at college too, but not, not as much. And so it's, yeah, again, kind of, a, you've got this chance uh kind of see you know what you think and I one I remember one conversation with our oldest son um you know our growing up we never did rated our movies that was just a conviction we had as a family that, that you know we didn't that there wasn't anything we needed to see in in those movies and um so our oldest son his senior year once that rule was relaxed went out with the girl he was dating and they saw the purge um which is like a horror type movie and he came back and he's like i understand i never want to do this again <laughs> so there were definitely some instances like that um now i want to back up because i got the uh, about the daddies know everything so what happened was when the boys were little and they would you know asking questions constantly like kids do and um you know i would give them an explanation for it and so you know well it'd always be like oh, how do you know that well i'm not going to give them a big long explanation so my my short answer was daddies know everything and apparently at one point a couple of them started to believe it for real and then but you know as they advanced into the teenage years they they quickly realized that uh, that I was kidding so because what i heard and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up but what I, what i also heard her say um, i took a note here was about the importance of them seeing you ask the questions to like mentors other people you knew other christians you could lean on um, cause that's a really good picture, right? It's a, it's a great picture to know where well, they've got people in their life that they lean on and they need to know the answers. Um, because I think that's one of the best le- lessons that we can teach our children. Like you, if you have mentors for every area of space in your life, then when you have those challenges, like not only am I here for you, but you know that I've got people that are here for me and you need to help find that tribe of people to be around to help walk you, help you walk through and keep you accountable and things like that. So I think that's a great lesson from that. The no rule senior year, 
Like that's a like, man, I wish I heard that five years ago. I love that idea. Where did that come from? Is that something you guys came up with or legit? I don't know if we heard it somewhere or came up with it. It was just something we discussed and, you know, there was a little bit of trepidation, I think, but it was still, you know, again, the thought was if they're going to mess up, let's have them do it while they're still here at home. Man, I really appreciate that. Like I've, we've got one more that'll experience that. The other two will probably poo-poo the idea because they didn't get to experience that. But I, <laughs> that's, that's always tough to, uh, <laughs> you know, when you have dif- uh, different ones, because our, our youngest one, um, because his brothers were staying up later he got the benefit of having a later bedtime as he got older and the older two are like well that's not fair and you know I mean and that's one thing too is just you know our three boys are wired so differently Um, our oldest he grew up uh, throwing a ball and swinging a bat our youngest one uh, despises sports of any kind so you know that's one thing with the boys I've always I always felt like we did really well with is encouraging them to follow their own path. I mean, obviously always seek God and his will first, but within that, you know, have their own, enjoy their own interests. And, you know, they really, they're wired differently. They react differently. We discipline them differently. And again, I'd get a question about why, you know, why are you doing this with Brian when you didn't with me? And it's like, well, because that doesn't, if I, take this away from Brian, it's not going to bother him, but it'll bother, I know it would bother you. Yeah, my mom said she couldn't send me to my room because I would just find a book. Yep. <laughs> you know, that, so that never worked. She, my worst punishment as a kid, because I was not a, I was not super athletic or active until I got into like probably junior high, middle, well, back when I, it was junior high. Now they call that middle school or whatever, but, <laughs> but yeah, outside was my punishment. Go outside. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and you know, you talked about making sure they put church first. And when I say church, I mean the community or church, because we talk about it like our we have a, a pretty large church that we serve at. And you know, through COVID and the you know, the attendance shrank, you know, because you couldn't come together and all that stuff they kept us from doing. But so people kind of got used to, hey, I'm just gonna watch it on Facebook because our you know, our pastors continued to put sermons out. And I think that it's made it difficult to get people back in the door because they got comfortable sitting in the living room and they see the ones that still sit in the living room. It's about the convenience, you know, and what they're missing is that community of church. You know, so like you said, no matter where they went, they found a church, they were attending church because the community helps you find those mentors in that tribe that you guys spoke of, you know, so I, I want to commend that, like staying in the community of the church was good. Yeah, and I think too, just being an active part of it, you know, when you're when you're at home watching on Facebook Live or whatever, you're not serving. Right. And again, that's I don't take any real credit for it. I think uh, a lot of times God worked in our boys' lives in spite of us, as in, in as much as it because of us. But you know, they are all actively serving. Our oldest is, you know, we're leads worship or helps lead worship at his church our middle son's in full-time ministry as a family pastor and our youngest he and his wife just started getting involved in a ministry where they're repairing wheelchairs to send over to ethiopia so they all it's not even just attending but it is is very actively serving right i'm really glad you brought that point up because that's a conversation we have a lot you know if we understand that that the community of church is about serving one another, showing up to serve and not to be served, you know, because I think your faith walk shifts drastically when you start looking, when you start going to church, looking for food rather than waiting to be fed. And when I say that, it's, it's about looking for the areas of opportunity that you know you're gifted in and how can you put those gifts to work and serve. And it's perfect that you said that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And we want to be conscientious of your time. So we're kind of keeping an eye on the clock over here, but you had in the information that you sent over to us, you had put it in there. And I'm curious, cause I want to know, um, how did you tell your husband that you were pregnant with Josh? I, I want I, to hear that story. I told her. She oh, you told pregnant. her. Okay. I want to hear that story. That's that piqued so, my interest. 
So we were married about four months at this point, and um, we were not, as I said earlier, we were not planning to have kids at that point. Um, we were actually wanting to wait maybe about five years into marriage or so to build, build up some financial resources. And um, this was 1995, so we didn't have, you know, email was kind of still just getting started. There were no most people didn't have cell phones. We certainly didn't have one. Um, also, HIPAA uh, was not a thing at that point. So what had happened, Shannon was, was working at a local hospital. She was still finishing up nursing school, uh, but she was working in a, like a unit secretary position at a, at a local hospital. And she had just been feeling off. And you said you thought you had the flu. Uh, and so it just gone in. And so they ran different tests, including a pregnancy test. And they didn't tell me that. I had no idea that was even being run. <laughs> yeah. And so she uh, later, because she worked there, could access the records and uh, came up and said pregnancy test negative. And so, you know, OK, we'll figure this out, whatever. Well, then I get home from work that night. And because of the way our schedules aligned, even at that point, I got home from work before she did. So um, I get into our apartment and play the answering machine because uh, I'm just kind of anal and did that the first thing when I got home. And there was a message from her doctor and said, I'm sorry, we gave you the wrong result. You actually are pregnant. And so at that point, I had about two hours to figure out how I was going to tell Shannon that she was pregnant. And so I cleaned the apartment probably like I never had before and never have since uh, just to make it, you know, as perfect as we could. Um, she got home and I sat her down in a rocking chair that we had in our, our living room. And I turned um, Stephen Curtis Chapman, I will be here on the, the stereo and looked into her eyes and told her that we were going to become parents. And she burst into tears because, again, it was it was just not what we had planned at that point. Now, the other flip side of that story, uh, Josh arrived shortly after our first anniversary. Brian was a couple months after our second anniversary. And then Tim was a little right after our fourth. My dad died before we reached our fifth anniversary. So had it gone according to the way we had planned, he would have never lived to see any of my kids. And as it was, he, Tim was 10 months old when he passed. So, you know, afterward, looking back, we could kind of see, okay, God had that under control, even though that was not what we had in mind at the time. So it, it leads me to share our story about our first child. I um, was diagnosed with testicular cancer in 1998. And um, we found out we were pregnant two years to the day of me finding my, my tumor. And it could not have been at a more inopportune time. Um, it was, we were, had just bought a brand new business and like it was really, really a difficult space. But looking back, you can always go, yeah, God, like that was the way God said, hey, I got you. You know, and it's like you say, you look back and you think, man, you know, it's there's always a God touching everything. If we'll just take time to mm -hmm. if we got great at it in the moment, <laughs> you know, that would help us in service. But being able to look back, like you say, man, your your dad being able to experience all three of his grandsons is, is such a gift. Right. Mm -hmm. Such a gift. And what a great story. So we, right, hold on. I want to hear her. Like, how did that happen? Like she cried immediately and said, I don't know how to be a mom. <laughs> What was your response when he said, we're going to be parents? I mean, I know you cried, but what was the thoughts? Uh, well, the biggest thing was, how do I finish school? Because she couldn't be pregnant and be in clinical. Wow. And I had one clinical left to go. And so it was going back to the clinical instructor and saying, now what do I do? We have six weeks of clinical left and I'm pregnant. You know, and so they had to get special permission and dispensation and everything else for me to even be able to finish. Wow. So again, that was God in the works because that was the thing that I had signed was that we wouldn't be pregnant. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, this was not planned. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's all worked out. Yeah. It's all worked out well. So 
he worked uh, he worked a lot. So if you were to share, um, like, as, let's say you're speaking to someone who is getting ready to be married or is newly married, having a few years under your belt, what would you give them as um, your most important piece of advice aside from put God first? Because I think we would agree that that's the most important thing. What would be the other thing that you would share with them to encourage them and give them a piece of um, practice, things that they could do? Um, It is not going to go according to your plans, but that's okay. God has it in control would be my first thing. Another I think, and it was a few years ago, I wrote a play that that our church did, and it was kind of some of the different characters of the nativity. Um, So, you know, uh, Joseph and Mary and the shepherds. And one line I wrote for Joseph is he's the the kind of the setup of it is he's sitting there struggling with the idea that, you know, he's going to have to parent Jesus, parent God. And um, the line I wrote was that God doesn't call us to be adequate. He calls us to be faithful. And I think that that would be a message I would share to, you know, again, to new marrieds looking to parents is that, you know, yeah, we're not adequate, but God still works through us and he covers over our inadequacies. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Shannon, you want to add anything to that? For people who need additional things I know we have enjoyed going through a book called Closer and it takes you through everything from before you were married through married what you're experiencing all the way through death and gives you a chance as a couple to be able to talk about all those situations that you may not bring up on your own but at some point in time in life it's really good to know what the other person's thinking and everything and to realize that through that, it's going to bring up things that you may or may not have known about each other and being open to learning and realizing that things in the past are in the past, but yet can bring baggage into any relationship. You know, sometimes counseling is necessary. God has given that gift to people and to not feel less than anyone else if you need to use that. I mean, that's why God has mentors. That's why God has people out there with that expertise. And, you know, rather than having a marriage suffer or be silent in the suffering, go and get the help that you need. And, you know, God intends us to live together and to function together. And sometimes we need that third person to be that outside person looking in because they've got a better perspective and can help bring things in. You know, we're told that in this world, we're going to have struggles. You know, God promises that to us in John 16, 33, but yet he also came to overcome. Well, I feel like part of that can be counseling. Part of that can be mentors. You know, we have to really put into our marriage what we want to get out of it. And so if you're if you feel that the person that God has designed you to be with is who God made him and is in his image, then we have to learn to love every piece of that, you know, and that goes both directions. And it's been a learning process and will continue to be a learning process for us for a while. So hopefully we have 27 more good years or more. There you go. So, there you go. Yeah. I stand in agreement with that. That was that was really solid from both of you. Yeah, appreciate absolutely. It. Well, again, just to be super conscious of your time, we appreciate you spending the time with us to share your knowledge, share your experiences. Um, it's been awesome. And I always ask one of the guests to pray us out. So whoever feels led. I will go ahead and do that. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk with each other, to share um, about what God has done Uh, about what you have done in our lives and through our lives. And uh, I just pray that uh, anybody listening or watching uh, would just be blessed um, by your wisdom through us, uh, because we know that's that's all that really matters. Uh, I thank you for the family that you blessed me with, for the wife that you blessed me with. uh, And um, just pray that you uh, continue to... uh, 
continue to work in our lives to uh, build your kingdom to serve you. Um, I thank you for this time with, uh, with Chris and Suzanne and just pray that uh, you continue to bless their ministry um, and uh, the work that they're doing. And uh, again, just that you touch the hearts of, of anyone viewing or listening, um, that above all, um, you would be glorified and that uh, you would work in, uh, in hearts and lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Faith Family Fulfillment, brought to you by Chris and Suzanne Vester. We hope you enjoyed listening to this week's guests and stories. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow Chris and Suzanne on Instagram at H-V-A-U-T-O-C-O-O and Suzanne.C.Vester. That's at S-U-Z-A-N-N-E dot C dot V-E-S-T-E-R. 